So I'd like to show you a little clip of how we greet the baby. We call it our Roots of Empathy National Anthem, but now I guess it's an international anthem. And this is a picture of what happens when the baby arrives for each visit. Hello, baby May, and how are you? Baby May, and Baby May is really no different from any of our other babies. You'll note her serious expression. Baby May smiled three times that year. And, you know, we live in a world where uh, we're expected to be Pollyanna and put on a happy regardless, and everybody loves a lover. But Baby May was what I call a philosopher king. She observed life. Um, it didn't mean you saw her dancing like that, you saw how happy she was, but her face didn't show you necessarily she was happy. So to be able to discuss the temperament trait of mood with our little baby May, who they adored and she adored them, made it all right to be a more serious nature. We shouldn't all be cheerleaders, it would be exhausting. <laughs> so the uh, permission for the children to be themselves and the understanding that was afforded to one another is incredible. So this idea about learning how we're different through our temperament traits, having worked with uh, families who were very abusive to their children, I realized that all of the suffering that the children collected, whether it was domestic violence or child abuse and neglect, was a result of the absence of empathy in the parent. There wasn't one of those parents who woke up and decided today is the day I'm gonna hurt my child. These were not monsters. These were people that I loved actually from working with them. And I do think it is only love that changes outcomes for people who are in big trouble, like parents who are abusing children. So what are we gonna do about breaking that cycle? So I did set up a program where I worked with families uh, through the school system. And without question, you were able to build understanding and insights, but what we know about the development of the brain, if you have had extreme adversity in the early years, it's very difficult to reverse some of the damages done to the brain. Not impossible, but it is very difficult. And when I worked particularly with teenage mothers, and there was one group who were severely uh, damaged, um, they had all lived through sexual abuse as children, and, uh, as well as physical abuse, and they were all currently um, addicted to either alcohol, all smoking, and some to drugs. They had great difficulty empathizing with their children. When the children would fall down, the mothers would say, no pain, no gain. And this could be a little toddler learning how to walk. So in order to break this cycle, because if you haven't experienced love, it's very difficult to know how to love. So I thought empathy develops at the breast. I believe we all inherit the capacity for empathy, that we are intuitively empathic. And it can wither on the vine because the child never experiences empathy in the attachment relationship. But why not learn from the attachment relationship? So bringing this little baby in, the children think they're just learning from the baby. We teach emotional literacy. Every time the baby de demonstrates some emotion, 
the children talk about what it is the baby's intention is and what the baby must be feeling. So they are learning the language for their feelings. And feelings are so crucial. You know, in schools we teach children to read, but if we don't teach them to relate, they will be lost in life. They will be lost in their relationships. They will not have success in their jobs. And we will not have peace in the world. It's our mountains and our continents and our oceans that divide us. But it is our similarities through our emotions that connect us. And we have the gift of this uh, globalized, interconnected world that allows us to see one another in other places, in other circumstances. And so often you hear that technology has eclipsed our humanity. But technology can be our friend in helping us find one another and realize how very much alike we are. When we have twinning programs with children in Roots of Empathy, and for example, we had Aboriginal children in Northern Ontario uh, communicating with Maori children in New Zealand, they said exactly the same things about their babies. They said exactly the same things about their families. They said exactly the same kinds of things about their friends. And when they make wish for their babies, which they all make wishes for their baby at the end of the year, they wished for the same things. And what they wished for should be on the policy tables of every country on the planet. They wished that the baby would be happy. They wished that the baby would be healthy. They wished, some of them would say, that the baby would always have a good friend. They wished that the baby wouldn't have asthma. And that's clearly little children who had asthma. They wished that the baby would never be bullied. That's some child who suffered. They wished that the baby would have a daddy. And they wished that the mommy wouldn't have to go to work. So very interesting things that children ache for and how unselfish that this is what they wish for their babies.